Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to ending corporate domination, creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Our guest today is Ryan Rittenhouse. Ryan is conservation organizer with Friends of the Columbia Gorge. Uh, he was last uh, uh, guest uh, in early 2014, so we're very happy to have him back on the show. Very Welcome. glad to be back. Thank Great. you. Good, yeah. So, uh, Friends of the Columbia Gorge, uh, that's Friends of the Columbia Gorge National Scenic Area. Actually, uh, yeah. before we start talking, I'm going I'm to show some pictures on the screen sure. here for just mm -hmm. a second uh, to show people what the Columbia Gorge looks like. Great, yeah. So, uh, actually, we can continue talking while, while, that's, okay. while that's going on. Mm -hmm. So, um, the Columbia Gorge National Scenic Area is a really distinct and different. I mean, it's really unique in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the Columbia Gorge National Scenic Area is is different. It's not a national park. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a forest. What is it? How did it come to be? Yeah, and that's, uh, we get asked, I get asked these questions a lot um, because it is kind of a rare thing. There aren't a whole lot of scenic areas in the country, and uh, the, the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area was one of the first. Uh, technically the second, we, we often call it the first, though. The, the first was technically this little tiny one out in California. I don't even remember its name now, but nobody knew what a scenic area was uh, back then. Um, but what they were doing was, and in fact there was an effort at first to make the what is now the scenic area a national park. Um, but there were a lot of significant hurdles to that, um, not the least of which was the fact that there are 14 urban areas out in the gorge. Uh, when you think about Yosemite, when you think about Glacier, when you think about Ye Yellowstone, you know there aren't any towns mm -hmm. in those national parks. Well there's 14 of them in the Columbia River Gorge. So trying to make a compromise between you know a national park versus something else or something that had no uh, additional oversight or environmental protection that was what was the negotiations were about and finally they settled on national scenic area which allows for preservation and and conservation of much of the natural area uh, in the gorge but also allows for the continued economic development of the 14 urban areas that are out there so that's why they settled on a national scenic area. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is kind of this strange, uh, it's a quasi multi-state federal agency that oversees it called the uh, Columbia River Gorge Commission. Uh, and they have appointees from both states, they have appointees from federal authorities, they have appointees from the governors, uh, from the counties, uh, and there's a forest service uh, appointment that sits on that as well. Mm -hmm. And so they work along with the public and us, because uh, we're the reason why the scenic area got established. We were the ones who lobbied for it and it, it, it was passed in 1986. Um, and we continue to be the only nonprofit specifically focused on preserving and protecting the scenic <coughs> area itself. Mm. Um, okay, yeah. all right. So. Um, it's a wonderful area, and I enjoy. I mean, totally enjoy going there. Uh, although I almost always am at the at the western end. And, and Most the, people are. Yeah, yeah. yeah the <laughs> eastern end, of course, looks quite different. Oh yeah. Than the western end. Yeah. In fact, I think it's about every ten miles or so you you move into a, a specifically uh, separate from the one you were just in bio region. Oh. Um, it, it's one of the only places in the world where you can do that, where you just drive in a straight line and every 10 miles you enter a new you know, oh. climactic and bioregional zone, uh -huh. um, which is pretty amazing. Um, and it's all because of the Cascade Mountain Range because mm -hmm. the Columbia Gorge cuts right through it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and a lot of people aren't really sure on the boundary of the, of the National Scenic Area. So it's not very wide, but it's on both sides of the river uh, and it basically goes up to the ridge line. So if you're on the highway, uh -huh. it's basically as far as you can see in both directions. Uh -huh. um, but it's very, very long. Uh, it stretches all the way from just east of Troutdale, where the Sandy River is. That's where it begins, and it goes all the way past Toad River, past the Dalles, all the way out to the Deschutes River in the mm. east. Uh, and so there's obviously a very wide range of, of environmental areas out there, including right. once you get out east, mm -hmm. the sort of more high desert, arid uh, area. So uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. And there's trails through all of it. So yeah. In yeah. fact, you were telling me that there's uh, that uh, uh, um, that you folks have an effort now of 
creating a unified system of trails? Yes, so that's called Gorge Towns to Trails, and that's our broad, overreaching, sweeping vision of uh, what to try to do with the Gorge Trail systems. Um, uh, and it's probably going to take decades to complete to realize its full potential. But um, you know, we've been looking. We've been looking around for a long time, and most of the trail systems out in the gorge, they're out and back trails. They're trails you drive to and park at a trailhead and do a out and back just for a few hours, and then you drive your car back home. Uh, well, over in Europe, they have. Uh, they've had for a long time these more, you know, sort of longer trail systems that are largely based on the uh, pilgrimage routes that pilgrims would take. Uh, but they are multi-day, if not multi-week long trail systems that are all interconnected. And so we've been looking at this for a long time and wanting to connect the existing trail systems in a continuous loop system so that you could hike the entire gorge without stopping, without ever having to get in a car. And it would also be a very front uh, a country experience is what we call it, uh -huh. meaning you wouldn't have to camp even if you didn't want to. You could, but ideally you'd be able to stop at a and b or a, or a Skamania Lodge or another kind of lodge or even a hotel every night that you were hiking out in the gorge. Uh -huh. um, so what this it's a, it's a really great idea and it's really cool and it'll really help, I think, incentivize a lot of the connections to the urban areas I was talking about and help uh, revitalize and, and grow their economies. Um, but uh, there's a lot of connections that need to be made. So right now we've, we've focused on a number of key areas. Uh, right now we're looking at the Steigerwald out to um, uh, sort of the Beacon Rock area and beyond as one key area to make mm -hmm. these connections. Another one is out near uh, Lyle. Uh, where we have we own a property up above Lyle called the Cherry Orchard, and that's currently open to the public. But we're growing that area and installing a new trail system on it. And then there's also the um, uh, Mount Alka connection, which is out by the Dalles. Uh, there's a little mountain there called Mount Alka, and we're we've been purchasing some land and trying to work on some other easements and and right of way agreements to make connections there. Mm -hmm. And so this is all done under the supervision, I presume, or agreement with the Columbia Gorge Commission? Oh yeah, and right. or any of the landowners in the area who are either buying from or getting agreements to do um, right-of-ways through their property. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are wineries uh, who are actually really usually excited about this prospect because uh -huh. it'll mean more people coming through their area and visiting their tasting rooms, things like that. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and any new trail systems, of course, have to be uh, gone through the regulatory process with the Gorge Commission, and we're involved in that right now with our uh, the Lyle Cherry Orchard, uh -huh. in fact. So, okay. All right. and uh, co Congress does not have to approve this. No, no, no. no Congress no. <laughs> passed the Scenic Area Act, mm -hmm. but then as a part of that, they empowered the Gorge Commission mm -hmm. to handle all this sort of thing. Uh -huh. And there have been some funding issues with the Gorge Commission and some some problems with them getting processing applications on time and things like that. Um, part of the reason for that is it requires both Washington and Oregon to agree on the funding for the Gorge Commission. If Washington, for example, doesn't agree to fund it at the level Oregon says they'd like to, then they have to go with the lower number, uh -huh. um, which, you know, it's hard enough trying to get a budget passed in one state when you're trying to do it where you need approval yeah. from two states uh, is, yeah. <laughs> is much, much more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so luckily, we did get that done in Washington over this past legislative session, and we are going to have good, solid funding for the Gorge Commission uh, for uh, at least the near future. Uh -huh. um, but there's still a lot of kinks that we're always kind of working on, yeah. um, and we can always use help. So. Okay, all right. Talk about some of the threats to the gorge. Yeah, so that's that's my focus. That's my job. I'm mm -hmm. as the conservation organizer. Uh, I work with Michael Lang, our conservation director, uh, on what we identify and perceive as the major threats to the gorge, uh, typically in terms of environmental or public health uh, damages or, or potential damages. And for the last few years, in fact, for the whole time I've been working at Friends, which is four years now. Uh, it has been coal and oil trains moving mm -hmm. through the gorge to new proposed terminals that they've wanted to build throughout the Pacific Northwest, Washington, Oregon, and even some up in British Columbia. So um, when I first came on board, we had uh, seven coal terminal proposals, new coal terminal proposals throughout that region, one in Canada uh, and six in Oregon and Washington. Um, as of this summer, we've defeated all but two of them. Um, the one in British Columbia and one that is sort of still remaining in Longview, Washington called the Millennium Bulk Terminal. Mm -hmm. uh, that terminal, however, did have its uh, land lease denied. It has a sublease uh, that needed to get approved and that approval was denied. 
So that was a huge victory, and without that approval, they can't build the facility. Oh. So for now, we've also defeated that one. Oh, okay. But and, they are appealing that decision. Right. And, and so. who, whose decision was that? Oh, um, ah, I'm blanking on that for the moment. Uh, but it was, right. uh, it's the... Uh, uh, was it a, st a state or? It's somebody or? dealing with land use applications. Oh, okay. And uh -huh. I'm sorry, for some reason, I'm blanking on the moment. Oh, that's right. But um, yeah, because on my brain, I've got right now, we're in the comment period uh, with the Department of Ecology with Millennium, because even though they've had that uh, lease denied, they are still trying to get their other permits. In the event that that lease gets, that lease denial gets overturned, mm -hmm. they will need these other permits in order to operate, build and operate the facility. So they're going ahead with the Department of Ecology on a, basically, it's a uh, water certification. It's called the 401 water certification. And so that comment period is open right now. And people can uh, go online to our website or to the Power Pass Coal website um, and take action on that item. If you aren't subscribed to our action alerts, uh, that's the best place to go is our website. And I believe they'll put it up at the bottom of the screen. Uh, yeah, yes, um, uh, yeah. And you can go there and subscribe to our action alerts, uh, which I send out a couple of emails a month on these important take action items that you can do to make a really big difference in what happens in these areas. And, okay. uh, we would really like to get this uh, 401 water permit denied. It would just be one more nail in the coffin mm -hmm. of this coal terminal. Okay. So. All right. Great. Oh, so I will. I I I pledge to go to your website <laughs> and sign up for your action alerts. I I've never done that. Oh, good. Right. Good. So, yes, yes, please I'll do, do that. that. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I have had concern about is these large corporate mega farms, uh, beef mm -hmm. operations. Yeah. At the uh, and I I don't know if they are in the in the uh, Columbia Gorge scenic area or not, or if they're just east of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there aren't any in the National Scenic Area itself, um, but there is a very large one, one of the biggest in the country, I believe, out in Boardman. Yes. Uh, strangely enough, right next to the Boardman coal-fired power plant, um, which is the last place I would want to be putting some of our food, um, but it's, it's right there. It's literally the neighbor of the coal uh -huh. plant. So they want to expand, and I don't know a lot about what's going on there. I know that um, Michael, our conservation director, and some other folks have, have been involved in a, a burgeoning coalition that's uh, looking at that expansion of that CAFO, a con confined animal feeding operation, CAFO. Um, but I, I don't know where that's gone or how it's going. It, it isn't something I've been working on because it's not sure. within the scenic uh, area. Yeah. But um, yeah, I'm personally very much opposed to those sorts of things. They're horrible for the environment. They're horrible for the animals. And they seem to be quite bad for us, too, to be uh, eating yeah. Uh, yeah. meat that comes from those kinds of places. Yeah, I, I had a guest on oh, a few weeks ago, and I can't remember who it was, but they were talking about those and talking about the effects of the methane uh, from all those cattle uh, going down into the gorge. Yeah, and yeah. So that was yeah. There's you know. there's a lot of interesting things that come out of those places. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, right, they're yeah. truly they're truly kind of hellish yeah, things uh, that shouldn't be legal in my opinion. Right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so we just have the the two terminals uh, that might be built. Uh, the Longview one uh, appears. Yeah, that's the last remaining coal terminal in in Washington, Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the oil terminals too, which oh, is, is that where you were oh, yeah, going? So, yeah, right. so, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we also have on the heels of all that, that coal proposals, oh, and, and why we've been so involved is because every single train that would go to any of those coal terminals or any of these oil terminals would all pass through the Columbia River Gorge. And right. it's because the gorge is the only near sea level crossing through the Cascade Mountain Range. It's right. this big trench that cuts right through the mountains. Mm -hmm. So it's the only, in fact, uh, less than 3% grade of a railroad track between the West Coast and Chicago. So every mm -hmm. heavy long train that wants to go to the West Coast wants to come through the gorge, and that includes these coal and oil trains. Mm -hmm. um, coal <coughs> comes off those trains, it gets into the air and the water, coal dust, because they're open-topped cars. And with the oil trains, when they've been derailing, they've been exploding. Uh, because this oil isn't typical uh, crude oil that you know you think of when you think of like the Beverly Hillbillies where you shoot a bullet in the ground and <laughs> black oil comes squirting out. That's not where this oil comes from. Right. This oil is fracked oil. It comes from hydraulic fracturing, which is very deep, 
they put pump hydraulic fracturing chemicals deep underground under extremely high pressure to splinter apart shale rock. And it's just like they do with natural gas, only instead of getting natural gas back up, they're bringing oil back up. There's a lot more uh, propane and butane in that kind of oil, and that makes it seem apparently much more explosive. So we had a disaster already in the gorge last year. Uh, Mosier in Mosier, Oregon, a train derailed and luckily did not was not going very fast um, because if it had, it probably would have blown up. But it just broke open, leaked oil, and, and the oil caught on fire, which is pretty bad uh, yeah, as it yeah. is. Uh, yeah, and um, there was a little school, right? There was a school within, within 400 feet. Um, if it had been going faster or if the wind had been blowing that day, the wind was dead calm that day, amazingly. Mm -hmm. uh, almost every other day that month, it was blowing very fast. We, we get up to 50, 60 mile an hour winds in the mm -hmm. gorge usually in the summer. So that was uh, a very close call. It was, it was very bad, but it could have been much worse. Mosier could have easily been wiped off the map. A similar uh, train carrying a similar product derailed in Lac Maganti, Quebec, back in 2013. And that train was going at 50 miles an hour, whereas the one in Mosier was going about 12, I think, or something like that. And the one in Lac Maganti leveled the town. Mm -hmm. uh, mo most of the cars blew up, and it just created these huge, massive fireballs that, that destroyed the entire town. Mm -hmm. And that could happen in Mosier. And in fact, we're fighting right now a rail expansion. That's the Union Pacific Rail Line that goes through Mosier. BNSF is on the Washington side. Oh. And we're fighting a proposal they have there to expand the, the rail siding that they have right through Mosier mm -hmm. because they have to slow the trains way down in Mosier uh, currently to get them to pass each other. Well, they want to expand their siding so that they can pass trains going much faster and put many more trains through that region. Mm -hmm. And that would greatly increase the risk of, a of another disaster in Mosier, uh, and this time it, we probably wouldn't be so lucky and people would probably right. die, I would right. think. So. Yeah. So in this last legislative session, there was a bill with regard to that. Can you talk about that bill and what happened? Sure, sure. Oh, and real quick before I mm -hmm. get off that, I do want to mention to folks that we're fighting, still fighting, the largest oil terminal proposal in North America, right across the river in Vancouver. That's the okay. Tesoro Savage oil terminal. Mm -hmm. All the oil that would go there would come through the gorge, probably come through Mosier. Um, and so we're continuing to fight that. Um, they're currently nearing the end of their process with uh, what's called FSEC, which is the Energy Facility Site Evaluation Council, FSEC. Uh, and they're the ones that will make a final recommendation to Governor Inslee. Uh, that's expected to happen maybe by the end of the summer, but probably not until the end of the year. And then Governor Inslee will have uh, 60 days to issue a final decision. Uh, so it's up to him. So if people want to continue to put pressure on Governor Inslee to do the right thing, please do. Okay. Uh, call him, let him know you care about this and that you don't want him granting permits for new oil terminals. Oh, so. right. And I presume signing up for your action alerts. Yes, that's uh, the best way to stay hooked would, in. Would, yes. or, okay. yes. or, or if not us, if you don't like friends for some reason, there's yeah. lots of other organizations uh -huh. working in this coalition. Columbia Riverkeeper, Physicians for Social Responsibility, the Sierra Club, Greenpeace, and more, many more. Mm -hmm. uh, Washington Environmental Council, Climate Solutions, I'll shut up there, but okay. yeah, we, right, have, right, we good, have over good, 140 good. organizations oh, who have joined us. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. so anyway, you were asking about legislation. Uh, yeah, so there was a bill in the Oregon legislature yeah. with regard to that expansion of the rail lines. Talk about the bill and what happened with the bill. Yes, so there, there was a number of different bills proposed, but the one that seemed to have the most momentum and that we had identified as the most important was called House Bill 2131. And that was going to uh, not actually do all that much <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. It was bringing us up to par with what Washington and California already have as their laws. Uh, things like making sure that the companies carrying oil had proper insurance coverage and had proper ability to account for a massive derailment spill. Uh, and there was a mitigation fund that they would have had to pay into to go towards mitigating any kinds of oil spills or disasters, mm -hmm. things of that nature. Um, and like I said, Washington, California already have this on the books. Oregon has the weakest laws on the West Coast. Yeah, so. and, and all of those things are things that we would naturally expect yeah. To be required. Yeah. Yeah. This wasn't even anything about like trying to stop the trains or anything like that. This mm -hmm. was this was just trying to bring us up to par with making sure that there is that the regulations are at least as safe as California and Washington already mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, the both the oil companies and um, uh, unfortunately the, the the railroad companies got very involved and really threw a lot of time and effort at stopping. And unfortunately, they were very successful. They almost got a very bad bill passed, which would have kept um, all of the recording and all of the reporting of this kind of thing totally secret. 
Um, and there was an article that came out in the Oregonian uh, right when that bill, when the bill was going to the floor of the House for a vote. Um, and it, it totally woke them up and a lot of the other uh, senators and, and uh, um, uh, House of Representatives uh -huh. um, to the fact that this bill was no longer good and was bad. Mm -hmm. And so that got them to turn it around on the floor and sent it back to committee. But unfortunately, it died in committee. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't able to have the, the original amendments put back in and sent back out to the floor, which is what we were hoping. Yeah. Um, so, so for once, as much as we all like to complain about the Oregonian, <laughs> <laughs> they did mm -hmm. us a favor. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, yeah, they did a good job on that one. Yeah, very, job. very much so. Right. And um, yeah, the, uh, so, we're, so yeah, unfortunately, we didn't get it past this session. Um, we are going to have a short, a short session next year, and we hope to bring this up again mm -hmm. then. So, because that's really the least that the legislature should do uh, is yeah. get us up to par with mm -hmm. our neighboring states. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, yeah. So the uh, so the bill is kind of written, but we have to wait until next year when the legislature yeah. goes into session yeah, before out of we session. actually see it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And in the meantime, though. Should people be contacting their rep Oregon representatives and senators to say, oh, yeah. we know this bill is coming up, yeah. we, we want your active support for it? Yeah, I always encourage people to, if, if you have something to say and you have something that concerns you, contact your elected representative and let them know. Mm -hmm. Particularly if it's something that you know is something that's going to be coming up, like a bill like this, because they really don't get communicated with uh, as much as you might think, and especially not by phone calls. So if, if they start getting you know, if they get one or two phone calls on, on an issue, they might take note of it. But uh -huh. if they start getting 10, 20, 30, 200 phone calls on an issue, <laughs> then yeah. suddenly it's uh -huh. a big deal and they realize that they need to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And even sometimes if your elected representative isn't necessarily reflective of your own values, mm -hmm. if they get enough pressure, they might still they swing can. your way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes not. We do have a fair amount of zealots in our elected positions, unfortunately. But so, but sometimes even you know diehard Republican conservatives will vote environmental if they know that their conservatives care about it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, okay. you never All right. know. Great, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, the U.S. Forest Service is doing a review of the Columbia Gorge management plan. Yes. Talk mm -hmm. about what that is. Yes. How long the management plan has existed, and give us a little details about that, mm -hmm. and uh, what. You know, how do Oregonians participate in that plan? We've got five minutes. Oh, five minutes, all right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so the, the management plan review is what's going on. That's, that's what it's called. And um, it's the Forest Service and the Gorge Commission. The Forest Service has a representative on the Gorge Commission. So they're jointly sort of overhauling and looking at their management plan. They're supposed to do it every, um, oh, shoot, I forget. It's supposed to be every five years? I can't remember, but it's been about 20 years since they've done it, okay. which is the it's point. Overdue. It's very overdue. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the other issues with funding is they haven't been able to do management plan review. So this basically covers everything that the Gorge Commission does. So the whole scope of their approach to regulating the scenic area. If it has something to do with that, it's included in the management plan. So whether it's oil and coal trains or whether it's uh, getting permits for doing construction in the scenic area, you know, people who just want to put a porch on their existing house, they have to get a permit for that from the Gorge Commission. Mm -hmm. um, there's stuff in there regarding the native tribes, regarding first foods and cultural resources and the protection and, and continued uh, uh, monitoring of those to make sure that they're not damaged or infringed in any way. So there's all sorts of things. And of course, our, our focus, our biggest focus right now is on the transport of fossil fuels, and that does touch on the management plan, but there's a lot of other stuff in there. So uh, recreation, of course, is a big part of it too. So they've they started their management plan review almost six months ago now, maybe even a bit more than that. Uh, they held some scoping hearings last spring, which was basically inviting the public to come to meetings and give them feedback on what they would like them to focus on in this review process. Uh, those scoping meetings are done, but you can still communicate with the Gorge Commission and let them know things that are concerning you and things you'd like them to consider in mm -hmm. the management plan review. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it's particularly the coal and oil, please do, because that's our number one priority <laughs> yeah, at Friends. Okay. So, right. um, and there are likely to be some new uh, events coming up this fall. Uh, so there might be some more meetings where they want to get public feedback on what they're starting to draft. Uh, this is going to be a, a multi-year-long process. It's probably going to take at least two years to complete. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so they're doing a review of the existing laws exactly. or regulations, and then they are will they actually 
write the new regulations or they might write recommendations for? No, they can totally change their, their existing management plan uh, according to feedback and what, what they think will make the best yeah. sense. So if there's something that's old and outdated or if there's something new that's happening that wasn't accounted for or if there was something in the management plan that uh, wasn't working well, they can update that and change that. So mm -hmm. that's the whole purpose of this process. And uh, we encourage people to get involved. And once again, go to our website, sign up for alerts. And uh, that's yeah, how you'll find right, out when there's right, opportunities. Yeah. Okay. All right. But, great. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I will fulfill my pledge to you <laughs> uh, and sign up for the action alerts. And, uh, and, and knowing that you only do a couple a month uh, makes it much easier. Yeah. I, I, it depends on how busy we are. Uh, sometimes yes, you'll um, only get one a month. Sometimes yeah. maybe you'll get four a month. But yeah, we don't still... want to flood you with stuff. We just want to get you the yeah. important take action items yeah. that will really make a difference. Yeah, because I, I, I think we all get those organizations that yeah. send a message a day, if yeah. not more, yeah. and they get we deleted. Don't do that. No, yeah. they get deleted, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, great. Well, uh, <clears throat> Any uh, any last thing? We've actually got two minutes left. Now we've got extra time to fill. So <laughs> two minutes. Uh, actually, uh, a, a final message uh, to, to the audience. Uh, gosh, I don't know. I think we've we've covered so much. I hope I yeah. wasn't talking too fast. Uh, no. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot going on, and um, you know, with with politics the way it is these days and everything, it can be a little overwhelming. But I just encourage people to to keep going and keep uh, keep staying involved. Uh, you don't need to do a lot, just do you know a little bit, and that's what it'll take. It doesn't take one person doing an enormous amount. It takes a lot of us doing whatever we can. Mm -hmm. And it really does work. I mean, when I started this work as an environmental organizer uh, about uh, 11 or 12 years ago now, I first got my start uh, with the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. Uh, those are the folks that go down to Antarctica and interfere with the Japanese whale hunt. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I did that for a year. and. Uh, that was great, and I was I was very much a radical. I still am, um, but I thought that that was the only thing that was ever going to make a difference. Yeah. Was uh -huh. like getting right in the face of the poachers and the people uh -huh. destroying the environment and and stopping them. But as as I've done more organizing work, I found that that can be just as powerful. Uh, uniting people, getting people to work together towards a common goal. As messed up as our politics are and as mm -hmm. our society is, there are ways to affect it uh, other than just direct action, which is great. But there's yeah, other ways yeah, to do yeah, it, yeah, and there's yeah, ways to be successful. Yeah, because in the end, all of these policies depend on policies that we, you know, supposedly support because we are we are the government. Yes. You know. Yeah. Well, we're all supposed to be anyway. Well, right. <laughs> it's we're, time we're we take it back. It's so. time we take it back. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here, Ryan. Thank you, David. Always right. a pleasure. Good. 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 So we've been talking with Ryan Rittenhouse conservation organizer with Friends of the Columbia Gorge. As Ryan said, the U.S. Forest Service and the Columbia River Gorge Commission have invited public comment on the Gorge Management Plan Review, so you can help determine future protections of the Columbia Gorge. Uh, visit the Friends of the Gorge website for links to both the present plan and to make comments. That's www.gorgefriends.org. Thank you for watching and we'll see you again next week. Bye.